Yeah, hi. Um, my name's Lester. Welcome. Um, I'm from the Vespa team at uh, Verizon uh, Media. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Vespa, don't worry. I'll, I'll try and get back to that a little bit later. Um, but all you need to know is that uh, Vespa has its roots in being a vertical search platform, hence its uh, name. Uh, but it's evolved into something more of a kind of a big data serving engine. At least that's what we call it. Uh, Vespa is mainly developed by a team in, in Norway, in Trondheim in Norway. Uh, we open sourced it 2017, uh, but it's been worked on many years before that uh, at uh, primarily Yahoo. Uh, Yahoo was acquired by uh, Verizon a couple years back, and we're now called Verizon uh, uh, Media Group. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is about using uh, machine learned models in production, particularly towards uh, search type uh, applications, and investigate and solve some of the kind of issues or problems or challenges that we quickly meet as we attempt to scale up these solutions, both in terms of traffic and in terms of, of contents. <clears throat> Okay, so um, with the rise of the various deep learning platforms uh, the recently, the last few years, we've seen a corresponding kind of increase in a new class of software um, uh, model servers. Uh, model servers work from the premise that you can take your model that you've trained in some of these platforms, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, and so on, and you deploy it on this model server. Um, the model server ser uh, solves things such as performance, scalability, lifecycle management, versioning, and so on. And it kind of puts your model behind some interface, RPC, HTTP, or whatever. Uh, and you can put your uh, application in front of that and query to this model server. Typical use cases, uh, image classification, send in your image, get back a distribution of objects or probabilities of objects in the image, uh, image uh, captioning, getting back a description of what's happening in the image, uh, text uh, translation, text generation, uh, input is sentence, game playing, input is a board, and so on. Many different types of uh, applications, and for these sorts of applications, this solution works well. For search, however, it's a little bit different. Um, in general, for search kind of type applications, we have uh, a set that works kind of like this. We have some input, some query coming in uh, for text search to be like query terms and so on. Uh, for ads and so on, it might be a, a user ID coming in. Same thing with personalization. Usually we have some sort of query enrichment going on first, adding stuff to, to the query. What do we know about the user, end user issuing the query and so on? The query gets sent down to a set of search nodes, or search servers or content servers. And there's a lot, there there's a lot of computation going on, depending on the application. And a ordered list of results are uh, sent back again, and eventually back to the user. Um, and lately, we've seen a rise in interest in doing this kind of ranking with this computation uh, with uh, machine learn, uh, learning. Uh, such as learning to rank, and more recently, things like neural information retrieval, and so on. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to evaluate the model in each of the results coming back from the content server, right? So where previously, where we had these model servers, we had one data point in and kind of data coming out. With this, we have many data points that we need to run through this the model server. And that quickly leads to a problem of network capacity. Fairly quickly, actually. Uh, the bottleneck becomes uh, uh, the network capacity. So for instance, if you have a query, you're returning 1,000 results per query. Each of these the results have a, kind of a data of around 500 floats per result, which you can reach very quickly with learning to rank features or like word and document embeddings, word embeddings, and so on. If you're running on a 10 gigabit network, you can sustain at max 300 uh, queries per second, max. Right? Then you're using all your network capacity to this which is generally a bad state of affairs. Um, to put this in context a little bit, at uh, Yahoo, we have multiple applications running in the tens of thousands of query per second per colo. So uh, for these kinds of applications, this sort of architecture does not work. It does not scale at all. <coughs> so the solution to this, looking at the equation on the right-hand side there, or uh, to the left there, uh, either to send less data per result, for instance. Um, you can't do that for learning to rank because the features are calculated on the content servers. Uh, but if you're not doing that, you can maybe you know, 
send some of the features to, to the model servers, create your own kind of custom software on top of the model server there. Um, uh, increases uh, memory on those nodes, maybe you have some update issues between what's going on in the content and model servers and so on. But the problem really is that what's going on in content servers and what's going on in model servers might be evaluating this ranking based on a different set of features. Uh, and that actually lessens the kind of uh, probability of you getting the globally best results that you can because the model servers can only work on the results coming from the content servers. So there needs to be some sort of correlation between what's going on. And that's difficult to do if they're running on a different set of features. You can also try to re uh, return less results per query, uh, but again, if you don't have good correlation between what's going on in these uh, two, two areas, uh, then you're decreasing potential quality of, uh, of your system. So the real solution is, you know, don't move data around, but instead evaluate the models on the content servers. And that's something we've been working a lot on, uh, on Vespa. Uh, by importing uh, these uh, kinds of models, uh, TensorFlow, Onyx, and XGBoost, and evaluating them directly on the con uh, content servers as well. <coughs> okay, just to describe a little bit more, uh, more about what Vespa is, um, I mentioned that Verizon acquired uh, Yahoo a few years back. Uh, Vespa has its roots from, from, uh, from Yahoo. Uh, we were merged together with AOL, and for a while we were called Oath. Uh, recently we were rebranded to Verizon Media Group, and basically we were working as a kind of a uh, technology producer for a, a large set of websites on the line. But uh, at Yahoo, or Verizon Media, Vespa has a long history, and it's always been a very popular piece of software inside of uh, Yahoo. We have hundreds of Vespa applications uh, uh, running, serving over a billion users uh, per month. At any given, a given time, it's running over hundreds of thousands of queries per second all over the world, over billions of content items, so it's in fairly heavy use. Uh, some small examples of what it's used for, a Flickr image search, for instance. On the right-hand side there, you have the front page of Yahoo. Uh, it has personalized uh, recommendations for uh, articles. Uh, also does uh, real-time native ads in between there, handles things like real-time bidding and so on. Uh, and one of the more fun applications that we have is that uh, on all the kind of uh, news pages at Yahoo, like Yahoo Finance and so on, there are comment sections. And as you all know, comment sections are generally garbage. Um, so there is a, a piece there that's where all these comments are ranked by Vespa using a neural uh, network. And it's kind of difficult to know how you should you rank these comments, what's the objective function. Uh, so we train this using a reinforcement learning uh, algorithm, which trains the model periodi periodically and pushes the model to, to Vespa. And based on data, it just continues the cycle to improve uh, the model. <coughs> Uh, to do all this, Vespa has a rich set of core features. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. There's a talk later today uh, that may, might go into um, a few more. Uh, but the three ones I want to kind of focus on a little bit is its elasticity, uh, scalability, and capacity for advanced relevant scoring. So peeking a little bit under the hood of, of Vespa, uh, we can see how it kind of achieves its uh, performance at scale. So whenever we have some query coming in, uh, there's always this query handler, which is where we do the query enrichment and so on. And after that's processed and, uh, and massaged a little bit, it gets sent down to uh, one uh, or all the content partitions. So in any single given uh, content partition, it goes through a set of, of stages. So the first is uh, a matching stage, where all the kind of relevant, or at least uh, somewhat relevant documents related to the uh, query are, are fetched. Um, binary decision. Then we typically have a first phase ranking function, which is a, a ranking fun a function that's uh, efficiently evaluated, very cheap one, which calls down the uh, amount of uh, uh, documents to be re-ranked in the second phase. Uh, that's typically where you have your kind of computationally expensive uh, computation to be, to be done. And thus, we can reduce the latency uh, or the time spent inside these content nodes. So for instance, if you have a machine learned model, that would typically be something that's very computationally expensive to evaluate. So that would be in your second phase ranking. Uh, but typically, you would add in a first phase um, uh, function to narrow down the search space. Anyway. 
Um, that's by utilizes all the cores on the nodes as efficiently as possible. Uh, but if you need to uh, reduce latency even more, you can add additional content partitions to distribute the workload over a larger number of, uh, of nodes. Uh, that's what makes it easy to do that. It automatically distributes the data among these nodes and, uh, and so on. So we've been hard at work uh, these last couple of years to add this kind of integration with, uh, with VESPA, with TensorFlow Onyx. If you're not familiar with Onyx, by the way, it's the Open Neural Network Exchange format. It's basically the kind of deep learning format all the um, vendors other than Google are using. Um, XGBoost is what you want to use if you want to uh, participate in the Kaggle competition, for instance. It's actually useful. Uh, whenever you create a application for Vespa, you create, you create what we call a application package. And it's a kind of declarative package of state, uh, what should the application do, how should it do it, and so on. And we try to make this using machine learning models in Vespa as easy to possible, as easy to use as possible. So you pretty much just drop your model into this, uh, this application package. And when you do that, Vespa takes care of importing uh, the, the models and makes them available so you can use them directly in your handwritten uh, ranking expressions such as this. Um, so for instance, this allows you to uh, very easily string together different models from different sources and so on. So for instance, you can have a, for instance, a click probability model trained in, in TensorFlow, maybe a dwell time estimator trained in PyTorch, and so on. And you can combine these non-linearly using XGBoost and so on. Uh, not saying you should, just saying you could. Um, but this is a kind of very cool, very unique feature that, that Vespa has. And I think uh, I've seen this other places. So. Um, when we um, import these uh, models into to Vespa, we don't rely on any kind of external kind of um, uh, executor for that. We execute them in the ranking language uh, in, in Vespa. So a few years back, I think two years back, we uh, introduced something called the Tensor API, which was an extension to our own uh, kind of ranking language, which is uh, an extension that handles um, multi-dimensional data, or any dimensional data, really. Um, and the API was designed to have like a very small set of, of core features, which could represent a large class of different types of computation. Uh, this is in contrast to, for instance, TensorFlow. If you've been working with that, you know that the API can be very large, very confusing, many operations doing the same thing. So we're trying to go kind of like the opposite, opposite direction. So here in this, this example here, on the left-hand side here, we have a computational graph representing a, a, a single layer in a neural network. We have a matrix multiplication between the placeholder, which is TensorFlow speak for input. Uh, weights is the weights trained by uh, your, uh, your uh, machine learning algorithm. A matrix multiplication, multiplication between those two. You add in the bias and uh, do a rectified linear unit at the end, for instance. So this is converted into the expression on the right-hand side there. And uh, on the back end, on the, the, the kind of node where this, all this is calculated, uh, when it sees this expression, it optimizes this. Uh, so for instance, the join and the reduce is optimized to a kind of single step, so we don't have to uh, introduce temporary tensors and so on. So we have many of these kind of small uh, uh, optimizations. And the benefit here is that when we have different models coming from different sources, they're all kind of uh, uh, translated to this, this format, so we have kind of one set of pl one place that we need to, to keep optimizing. <coughs> So, we wanted to test this a little bit. We set up a benchmark uh, for this. Um, and we wanted to kind of test this uh, hypothesis that uh, sending data around is uh, not a smart thing uh, to do. So we set up a test where um, kind of emulating a recommendation system, a blog recommendation system, where we have a user representation with a vector, and we have a document representation with another vector. and um, we set up a first phase, which is basically a dot product between them, typical recommendation system. 
Uh, and then we have a, a second phase, which is a neural network, uh, which we try to evaluate on the content node, and alternatively on uh, an external model server here, uh, TensorFlow. And additionally, we have uh, the green one, which is baseline with data, which is the uh, doing the first phase, but sending back the data as if you were going to send it to an external uh, server, uh, but not doing anything with it, just setting a baseline. And then uh, the model itself is about 200,000 parameters, so it's a fairly reasonably sized uh, model. So these are some of the results that we got. On the left-hand side here, we see the latency um, evolving as we increase the number of clients. So clients is a, a number of uh, kind of clients pushing at the same time, acquiring at the same time, up to 120, which is fairly heavy, heavy traffic. On the right-hand side, we see uh, the throughputs, or the QPS, queries per second, how that evolves. And the interesting kind of thing to notice here is the green line uh, on the QPS there. It flats out fairly early, actually, very early, uh, around less than 20, uh, 20 clients. And that is a point where we reach network saturation. Right? So uh, we cannot push more data through this network, and of course latency increases because of this. And you see a TensorFlow tracks uh, below that a little bit. And just to be kind of clear here, uh, no amount of hardware acceleration that you can put on your TensorFlow node or your external model server, be it GPUs or TPUs or quantum computers or whatever, uh, can allow you to push through that green uh, line there, right? It's the hard scalability ceiling of just sending data around. Um, so the blue line there is, uh, is the VASP, you can see that obviously scales uh, uh, much more, much better. They're not sending data around. So this is uh, how it looks with uh, running, th I think it was three content nodes. We're sending my way 1,000 results uh, per, per query. We can improve upon this. Uh, if you want to have a, a better uh, latency and so on, you can add additional uh, content nodes. This will have the effect of decreasing uh, latency because we're distributing the work around a larger number of, of nodes. This has a kind of a dimin diminishing effect, however. Um, you can't add an uh, infinite number of, uh, of content nodes that go down to zero. Um, this is Omdahl's law, as you might be familiar with. Um, uh, basically says that whenever you're doing some computation, you have just a fraction of the work is parallelizable, and only the parallelizable part will um, be affected by adding additional uh, uh, content nodes. So this has a diminishing effect. Um, however, there is another way of using uh, these uh, additional computation nodes or, or content nodes, if you want to. Um, and that is actually by having them doing uh, more work. So if you're kind of satisfied with your SLA, if you're satisfied with running at, say, 100 milliseconds at 95% uh, percentile, meaning that 95% of all your queries are going on less than 100 milliseconds, you can kind of keep adding uh, work to your um, uh, uh, content nodes uh, to actually re-rank a larger number of documents. So. Um, Earlier, I mentioned what, went, what you really want to do with your machine learned models is that you really want to run them on all of the documents that you have available. But typically, that's much too expensive to do. That's why you have to introduce this phased uh, ranking. But by adding additional content nodes, you can use uh, additional uh, uh, compute to actually re-rank a larger number of, of documents. And this is something that scales much more linearly. This is uh, uh, Gustafsson's law. This is the workload uh, increases as parallelity increases. And this is something you cannot do uh, when using some external model server, right? Because you're just trying to push more data across the network and you've already capped that. Right? So that's an interesting, uh, interesting effect. OK, um, so to conclude, um, External model servers don't really scale that well for uh, uh, when you're using machine learning in search. Um, and to, to combat that, you put, the, you put the evaluation on the content nodes, and that gives you many more options to scale uh, in how you can control latency, you can uh, control throughput, and you can uh, increase the number of re-ranked results with your machine learning models, thus leading to higher pot uh, potential quality of your results. Um, multi-phase ranking, 
Um, when you, whenever you introduce like a first phase and a second phase and so on, I mentioned previously, it's very important with the correlation between these phases. Unfortunately, we've seen many, many times where users of, of USPA particularly have uh, not been really that cognizant of the, what's, what the, what's going on in the first phase and what's going on in the second phase, thus leading to a, a, a worse kind of system level uh, retrieval. Um, question for me to you, if any of you have been working with uh, multi-phase ranking, come find me afterwards. I really would like to hear your stories. Um, model support in uh, or machine learning model support in Vespa is ongoing work. Uh, there are some sort of models that we, we still don't uh, support currently, uh, but it is an open source project. Uh, if you'd like to contribute, uh, come find me uh, afterwards as well. That was all I was going to say. Thank you. Mm. Okay, do you have any question for the lesser? Someone want to ask something? Yeah. Hey, thanks very much for the for the talk. It was really interesting. Um and just seeing the talk makes me sort of want to play around with Vespa a little bit, and I'm wondering if you have any pointers what the best uh, place to start would be. So you were asking about if you have any kind of uh, simple places to start playing around with this. So you see, we'll find many resources at our homepage, Vespa AI, including many sample um, applications uh, and uh, use cases there, which will, could really just get you started, including sample data and so on. So there is a uh, tutorial there, which um, builds upon this blog recommendation application that I showed. So that has all the data available and so on to recreate those numbers. 